Shalom Chavrim. It is nice to get a chance to come and be with you again this evening and to talk to you about uh, the book of Esther. And I know that's something I keep getting started on and we're going to get into and we don't never really get into it before. I, I did do a teaching on YouTube on this series here, but I haven't done one on WBN TV here as of yet. But uh, um, and even the one I did on YouTube, there's been things that the Lord has revealed since then. And so I wanted to come back and visit this story once again with you, especially because we're in a very critical hour and I can't express enough to you that critical hour that we're living in. And I want to share with you the, the, the story of Esther in a way that you have probably never thought about this before and, and no doubt it may change your thinking on Esther altogether for the rest of your life. Um, and maybe you have heard this already because maybe you've heard me speak about it or maybe God has already revealed this to you yourself. Uh, uh, either way, uh, let's get right into the scripture here. First, just ask a blessing from the Lord on the reading of His Word. Heavenly Father, we ask you, dear God, that you would bless this word, Baruch et Hadavar Adonai, and to us, dear God, Aleinu, and uh, that it will be a blessing for us. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Anach Hanu Shalet Adonai, Amen, Amen. So we ask the Lord to bless it in the name of Jesus Christ uh, as we go here. Now, it says here in uh, Esther chapter 1, and I'm going to kind of jump around as I go here. I'll read a little bit. We won't read every single verse, uh, but just to kind of set the stage. And it says, And it came to pass in the days of uh, 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 Ahasuerus, uh, kind of an odd name to say for the king there, Vehi um, Bayamim Ahasuerus. Uh, anyway, we won't go into that. That's a little tough to say. Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus. Mm. And it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, he is the Ahasuerus who has reigned from Hodu to Kush, uh, 127 provinces in those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was in Shushan, the capital, capital, in the third year of his reign. He made a feast for all the officials of his servants, the army of Persia, and Midia, the nobles and officials of the provinces being present, when he displayed the riches of his glorious kingdom in honor of his uh, splendorous majesty for many days, 180 days. And when these days were fulfilled, uh, the king made a seven-day feast for all the people who were present in Shushan, the capital. Uh, wow. Now, what we're going to look at here is that as we begin to look at the story of Esther, I want you to kind of begin to put in your mind, we're seeing here a reflection of Israel, uh, is what we're seeing. Now, there are those that might would argue, well, this is a, a, a Persian king, uh, we're in the land of Midia as well, Persia and Midia, of course, remember this is where Moses was, was in Midia, um, so nothing kind of unusual there. And another kind of odd thing about the book of Esther is we never see the divine name of God mentioned. Hashem is not mentioned here. Uh, yod heh vav He, the divine letters for the divine name of God. Uh, some people say Yahweh. Um, that's, we'll, we'll just stay with that for right now. But we don't see uh, him here, his name written in here. And I re believe the reason being is because the king himself is a type of Hashem in the reading of this, in the story here that's going to mirror uh, Israel and the things that would happen. Now, oddly enough here, if you'll notice though, after the 180 days, the king made a seven-day feast for all the people who were present in Shushan, uh, the capital. Now, that seven-day feast, this is when he's going to call out, uh, he brings them together, they're having, uh, they're, 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 they're drinking and stuff, and of course we find in verse 8 it says, and the drinking was according to the law, there was none, no co coercion, uh, for so the king had established for every officer of his house to do according to each man's pleasure. And I do believe that this is a type of the Spirit of God that is poured out, uh, that God pours it out in measure, uh, as we know as, as Christian people. Um, but a lot of times people have always taken that this could not be a type of Israel because one Vashti, uh, she was being asked to be paraded before a bunch of drunken men so to speak. But see, the scripture doesn't say that they were a bunch of drunken men, 
but they were drinking according to their pleasure. And, uh, and, according to that, and according to that pleasure they did drink, and no one was coerced to drink. It was just at their own free will. And <clears throat> that's very interesting because that's the way God is. Our God is a good God. He's not the type that will force you into anything. But the more that you have desire of, the more He will give you. The more He'll reveal Himself. The more He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit if you so desire that. But Queen Vashti, the scripture said she had also made a feast for the women. Pardon me, I have to drink a little bit because I'm still trying to get over this flu. In the royal house of the king Ahasuerus on the seventh day. And when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he told uh, Muhammad, and he names all the other men there, to bring Queen Vashti before the king and uh, adorned with the royal crown to show to the people and the officials her beauty. Now, what is this? Queen Vashti, although she is not a, a, a Jewish woman at this time here, but it still types Israel. And the reason why I say that, because you have to remember, Abraham was not a Jew either, but he was called out from among the, the, the Semitic peoples of that day, and he was separated you know, from uh, his family down in Iran. You know, this, uh, the Ur was believed to be down in what we call modern-day uh, Iran or Iraq, uh, down in that area along the borderline there where those two run together down towards Ku uh, modern-day Kuwait. And uh, God called him out and separated him, and he did it as an unconditional covenant with Abraham and with his wife Sarah, as we know these things. And so when he was called out of God, he was just another man of that day. He was one of the sons of Noah, you know, as far as descendant of Noah there. And uh, of course we had the Shem, Ham, and Japheth's people at that time that were dwelling on the earth. And so he came down and, um, and he believed God and God made a nation from him and, and from his seed he said that your seed would possess the gates of his enemies. Uh, we know the different scriptures that, that pertain to that. And then Israel became a mighty nation from Jacob uh, you know, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarch fathers as we, as we have it today. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had the 12 sons uh, through his different, through his, both his wives, Leah and Rachel, and of course his two uh, concubine wives as well. So they made up the 12 tribes of Israel. And, um, and, in, and in this here, what happens is when they come down, um, you know, finally Israel goes into the captivity. Moses leads them out during the, uh, the Exodus, brings them up. Joshua brings them into the Promised Land. The land was divided out. And then, of course, Israel reigned there for many, many years. Now, um, at this particular time here, though, we, you know, uh, Israel is in captivity because of, uh, because of, you know, not serving God the way she should have been serving. And so Israel is now in captivity. But at this point here, in the, in the typology, we would call it here, when, when Vashti is summoned to come out to be seen with the king, this is when, um, when Yeshua came, he came as a royal king of Israel. Even the scripture says, they said that you say that you're king of the Jews. He was the king. And God had come down and stepped down from, from, from heaven and got into the body of a little baby. And he lived in that body and he came and he was a man. He grew up as a child here on the earth. And it was the Spirit of God living inside of this man called Jesus, Yeshua as we say. And when he came on the earth and everything and the time come for Israel to come out and to recognize who her king was, she refused to do so. And this is exactly what Vashti did. Vashti is a queen. And Ahasuerus the king, he loved her. And every year he had this great uh, to-do and he wanted to show her off because he was pleased with her. And so when he called her out, she refused to be seen with him. Now, some people say it was because of the drunken party, and that may be very well so, because in the story with Yeshua, when he come on the earth, we can see a couple of scenarios here that perfectly lay that out. What did the Jews say of his day? 
Oh, this man, he just hangs around a bunch of publicans and sinners, and he's a wine bibber and a gluttonous man. I mean, that's exactly what the party was portrayed to be. But I take it a step further. I take it a little step further, and I'll tell you why. Because on the day of Pentecost, when Israel was supposed to come out and be seen with their king and stand at his side, instead he was rejected and he was hanging on a cross. And the Romans there crucified him. And let me tell you something. Those Romans that were there, no wonder why the scripture says in Daniel that, a, that the princes shall come will be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. It's no coincidence that Rome is trying to get back in control of Israel today. No wonder why the Vatican keeps pushing for the city of Israel, for different landmarks in Israel. They want control again. And they're going to get it. You think that's a joke? They'll get it. Just as sure as I sit here and talk to you today, they'll actually get that control again. Why? God is setting the scene up like it was back in the days when Jesus was on earth. And what happened after he was rejected and his life came out of him? When they took that Roman soldier, he took it and pierced his side and ripped it open. And that blood and water coming down from his side, it was a sign to Israel that he was the rock right there. Why? Because the water come out separated from the blood. I go a hundred different ways when I get to, th get to thinking on these things. That's the way the temple was. You know, um, there's, a, there's a man named uh, Kevin Klein. And I know Kevin, I believe Kevin listens to some of the videos that I do here. Kevin is a, is a filmmaker and uh, produced recently a documentary that just came out on YouTube. I actually got to preview it before it went public. And uh, we may even ask him if we can air it here on WBN TV. I'm sure Kevin would give me permission to do that. But uh, he brought up an interesting subject as far as where was, the temp where was the temple actually erected at. And Kevin takes a little different view that it wasn't on the Temple Mount. In a very convincing view at that, he, he, he puts it more to the, uh, more where the city of David is, it is now there, just a little bit more off of there. An interesting argument that he makes there for, for his case. But nonetheless, one of the things that Kevin brought up to me is that the, the, um, the Hezekiah's tunnel where the water goes in there, if you've ever been in Israel and lived there, I lived there for, for some time and uh, you can walk through the tunnel that was dug, the aqueduct, in order to get the water inside the city in case the city was besieged. Well, that water is, there's, there's a cavern higher, and it causes the water pressure to be very strong. <clears throat> and he believes that what happens, in fact, they, they've proven it from a geological perspective, that they could take, and when the, when, the, when, the, when the water's coming up, they're able to put a stone in that river there and force that water up into the temple where the holy of holy or where the altar was to be able to wash the blood out from all the sacrificial animals and you'd have to be you realize how many hundreds of gallons of blood no doubt would roll out of that temple during all these sacrifices being offered but the interesting thing is in the temple it's like rabbi orly used to say he said the temple is laid out like the human body and the holy of holies is where the human heart is and when Yeshua, when they pierced his side and that blood and that water come out of his side there, the temple, they had a trough that would lead out and that blood would wash up underneath there, go up underneath the little stones there and come out the side of the temple. He had mixed water and blood running down the side. <coughs> Every single type there was was for us to recognize who he was. No wonder why he said to the woman at the well, if you know who it was that's speaking to you, you'd ask me for a drink that you don't have to come here to drink no more. Draw this water here. I'd give you that water. And so on the day of Pentecost when he did, notice he breathed on his apostles. He said, receive you the Holy Ghost. Showing that he was the very God in the Garden of Eden that breathed on Adam's nostrils and breathed in Eitz Chaim into his body. It's the same God there. 
was the same God that breathed on the apostles after the resurrection. And so he told him, go and wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And they gathered together there, 120 in the upper room. And that day of Pentecost came and there came down a, 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 a sound like a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house. And when they come out, they staggered around like a bunch of drunk men. You know what? How many provinces did we have here? Just thinking about that right there. I know they had 180 days in there, and, and I think it was 127, yeah. And 127 provinces. Isn't that interesting? 127 provinces were represented there. 120 in the upper room. Awfully close, isn't it? Do you realize how many different nations were in Israel on the day of Pentecost when this happened? And they stood up and they said, these men are full of new wine. Israel didn't want nothing to do with it. <clears throat> she was summoned to come out and be seen with her king and she refused it. Now, everybody might be saying amen right about now, but you know what? My question is going to be is we're going to get down to Esther in a minute and then we're going to see whether or not you can still say amen because it's going to come home in just a little bit. Anyway, God help me to, to continue on with this here. So Queen Vashti, she, 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 you know, she'd made the feast before she was, she, the, and, and moving on down here to about verse 11, for, uh, for she was beautiful of appearance, but Queen Vashti refused to come in the king's, uh, the king's command. By the hand of the chamberlains, the king therefore became very enraged, and his wrath burned in him. And that's what happened with God. When Israel refused, he was long-suffering, so he watched his own son die on the cross when they cried out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. You know, there's a lot of replacement theologists that sit there, see there, you know, I mean, they, they, they condemn Jesus to death and everything. That's why God give it to us. Mm -hmm. You better be glad I have to drink something to get my voice back again because I'd have a field day right now. Let me tell you something that out there that believe in this nonsense of replacement theology. Let me, just, let me just shake you just a little bit. When they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children, it wasn't a bad thing that they were trying to say or do. Don't get that mixed up. You understand what I'm telling you here? Because what they were doing, they didn't know it, but they were asking for his blood to be applied upon them. Do you not realize that when, when, when Joseph's brothers, when they condemned him and put him in that pit and sold him out, had they not done what they did, do you know what would have happened to them? Had they not took that lamb and killed it and poured it upon their, on his coat and took it back to his father and said, Is this not your son's coat or no? Tell, you, tell us if it's so. We would have ten less tribes today. There would only be two tribes that would be believing right now if that had happened. And that would have been Joseph and Benjamin. Well, we might have got Ephraim and Manasseh out of that, so maybe we would have had three tribes. But no, God applied the blood that they offered to that goat for an atonement for their sins. And this is one reason why we have the, the law of Moses that says, you have a scapegoat and a sacrificial goat. The scapegoat was Joseph. In this case here, the scapegoat is Yeshua. My Jewish brethren, listen to what I'm telling you when I tell you this. The law that God gave Moses is not here for just no reason. It's there for a purpose. The scapegoat, Yeshua was the scapegoat and the sacrificial lamb. When Joseph's brethren condemned him because he was spiritual, they took the goat and killed the goat. That was the sacrifice for their sins, the one that died. Yeshua died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. We said, let his blood be upon us and our children. Why? In order to cover us for the next 2,000 years. That's why. What we meant to be evil, our forefathers meant to be evil, God applied it for our salvation. 
to atone for our sins. And so for those of you that think, well, you know, Brother Steve, you think that, uh, well, you know, these Jews, they never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, so they got to be lost. The only, way to, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Exactly right! It doesn't do away with the atonement. His blood was applied. No wonder why you have in your Christian Bible. Let me just read it for you so you'll know. Revelation. Um, I forget exactly where. Let me just see if I can't find it for you real fast. So they cried out, How long? Revelation chapter 6 of 6 and verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, how holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given er unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that thou shouldest rest yet for a little season until thy, their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Do you think Christians cry out for vengeance? Do we not know the scriptures at all? Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's what a Christian does. Stephen, the first martyr, he cried out, Father, forgive them. And he looked up and he said, I see heavens open and Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Something, I believe, of that nature there. <clears throat> anyway, back to Esther here. So Vashti refused to be seen with the king. And then in verse 13, then the king spoke to the wise men, those who knew the times, for such was the king's procedure to turn to all who knew law and judgment, those closest to him. And he is inquiring of them what should be done under this situation. Interesting how in the days when Jesus was on earth, there were wise men then too, right? Isn't it funny where they're from? I like that, right? Yeah, from somewhere around that part of the country, Persia, Media. Yes, absolutely. So anyway, by the law, uh, going on down to verse 15, uh, by the law, what should be done to Queen Vashti for, for not having obeyed the bidding of the king Ahasuerus, conveyed by the hand of the chamberlains? That is an interesting point right there. The chamberlains had already con you know, conveyed this message to her. Israel was being told all along, your king has come to you. The prophets had conveyed the message. He comes lowly, sitting on the fold of an ass, on the colt. How many testimonies spoke of the coming of Yeshua? David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In the 22nd Psalm. On and on and on we can go. Let's move on with it though. So we know though that the king ends up having to put... He, now, now, he removes her from being queen. We don't find anywhere in the scripture where he removes her from being his wife. There's another one for the replacement theologist. She's not removed as being his wife. She just removed from being his queen. <laughs> so we move on down into this. Mimikin declared before the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but against all the officials and all the people of the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's deed will go forth to all women, making their husbands con contemptible in their eyes. Um, and they will say, King Ahasuerus said to the queen Vashti before him, but she did not come. Now, as we move on down, though, they, let's see, um, verse 19, For If it please the king, let there go forth a royal edict from him. Let it be written to the laws of Persia and Media that it not be revoked, that Vashti never again appear before the king Ahasuerus. Now, this is the law that they put before him. And, by the way, let me just mention something to you, a little interesting about this law. 
It is believed that, that um, Mimikin, by many rabbinical scholars, was actually Haman. You have to remember, Haman was later exalted up. And typically in that time frame, in that period of time, your name would be changed in your exaltation. And so there's many rabbinical scholars that believe that uh, Mimikin was actually Haman, and this is one of the reasons why he wanted the, the punishment to be irrevocable, because um, um, he, he was concerned. He was very concerned about what would happen later. Um, anyway, just a little tidbit there to think about. Uh, and let the king confer her a royal estate upon another who is better than she. Uh, this, is, this is what uh, Mimikin re recommended to the king. Then the king's decree, which he will proclaim, shall be heard throughout all his kingdom, uh, great though it be, and all the wives will show respect to their husband, husbands, great small, uh, and small alike. And the proposal was favorable in, their, in the eyes of the king and the officials. So, and the king did according to the word of Mimikin, and he sent letters in all the king's provinces to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language. Now, we get into chapter 2 here. We see it says, After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. I really think that is a very beautiful passage. Uh, I know there's some people would probably think differently on that, but the thing is, is the point that I see with what he's done here is it's compassion because he still loved her. Regardless of what happened, he still loved her. And he remembered what, uh, you know, he remembered uh, Vashti. So, and what had been decreed against her. The king's attendant said, let there be sought for the king young maidens of beautiful appearance. Now we're getting into the gospel changing hands um, at this particular point here, when Israel refused to be seen with her king.